This lecture is going to talk about uh, two different types of studies and some related keywords surrounding studies. Uh, I said in the last video that you should read section 1.3 in Biostat, and in fact the second half of section 1.3 in the Biostat textbook is related to types of studies and these specific words that we'll talk about here. So we'll start with the two different types of studies. I'll probably actually go in the opposite order, observational studies first and then experiments. I'll talk about placebos and treatments, uh, then principles of experimental design, and then last, I'll introduce one new type of variable, but it's also kind of a relationship of variables uh, that creeps into this world of studies a lot. So let's just jump into it. Observational studies should be a keyword we add to our course notes. The idea here is when you go out into the world and simply observe what is, we're going to call it an observational study because you're just observing how things are without directly influencing them yourself, then you haven't had a direct hand in those measurements. A study where you simply observe what is or exists in the world around us. So for the most part, this is going to be the sort of study ecologists are going to play, are, are going to deal with. You're going to go out there into the world and you're just going to measure, I don't know, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere or the girth or height or diameter of trees, or you're going to count the number of frogs in a pond or something like this. I've pulled up our studio here to give us some examples pretty close what I was just listing off. So here's a data set named CO2, and I used that question mark trick to pull it up in R for us, and it's Measurements of atmospheric concentrations of CO2 in parts per million from 1959 to 1997. Because we haven't had, okay, let's not get into it, a direct, uh, you specifically have not had the full force of causing the atmospheric concentrations of CO2. We're going to claim that this is just you going out into the world and observing what is. This sort of study here would simply be observational. Let's try one more for the uh oh, looks like our studio froze on me. There we go. Let's try one more example for the geosciences. Well, it's as close as I could come up with for now at least. Old Faithful Geyser data is a data set already built into R. It describes waiting times between eruptions of the geyser and the duration of the eruptions for Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone National Park. Because this data set is just you going to the geyser and counting time until it erupts and then the duration of each eruption, we are going to call this an observational study you have not told the, the earth to produce this geyser at specific times or for specific lengths because you did not directly cause these actions to happen. You just observed them. This is an observational study. I've got one more in mind. It's a data set we've seen before. Tooth growth. The effect of vitamin C on tooth growth in guinea pigs. So in this case, we are now working our way towards an experiment. The difference is you have a direct hand in how much of what is given and when. Okay, let's break that down. You, the statistician or analyst or biologist or what have you, are giving vitamin C and you are choosing to give vitamin C in two different ways, either directly or through orange juice. Because you have chosen to give vitamin C 
directly or in orange juice, you have chosen to give it in these amounts, and you have chosen to give it daily, you have had a direct hand in the outcome of this experiment. So the first two examples I gave us are observational because you just went out into the world and observed what is. This third example I'm giving you is experiment because you have chosen the guinea pigs. You've chosen how many guinea pigs. You've chosen what they will receive. You've chosen how much of it they will receive and how often they will receive it. So let's go back here and move to our next type of study. An experiment is a key word for us. A study that involves active choices made by the researcher and applied to the subjects. So really the key word in the definition of an experiment is when the researcher has an active role to play. So that was the example of the data set tooth growth, where you chose all those very specific things. Our next word that is directly related to an experiment is treatment. In the case of the guinea pigs, the treatment was the vitamin C given. The treatment is the thing, the piece of the puzzle that you are interested in how this thing influences the subjects. So from the data set tooth growth in R, vitamin C is the treatment. Let's give you just a few more examples of what a treatment in an experiment might be. If you are going out into um, some open field and you are planting, okay, so here's a little bit about me. I came from the University of Kentucky and in Kentucky, they still grow a lot of tobacco and they're very interested in what fertilizers will help to tobacco grow more. So if you're gonna go out into a field and you're gonna actively plant tobacco, and then you're going to have a simple random sample that selects specific tobacco plants for a treatment to be applied to them. Think of applying like nitrogen or more water than you expect or specific amounts of nitrogen or specific amounts of water. If you're going to actively apply excess water or excess fertilizer or excess nitrogen, that Water, fertilizer, nitrogen are the treatments to be applied to this made up example about tobacco plants that I have. Okay, I hope from those two examples, you get an idea of what a treatment might be. A word you might hear a lot is the word placebo surrounding experiments and the word treatment. A placebo is a fake treatment. It seems odd in the world of ecology and geosciences, and maybe we have some computer science related or math related majors in this class. I haven't really heard from them too much yet, but we'll see. It seems odd to have a fake treatment show up in these sort of circumstances. So I'm not gonna highlight the word placebo, but it is a word I think you all should hear. A fake treatment relative to the tooth growth data set would just be like a sugar pill. Really, what you're trying to do is have a baseline measure from which to figure out at what rate are guinea pigs' teeth going to grow. If guinea pigs' teeth are going to grow at a certain rate and the vitamin C you're giving them as treatment really doesn't seem to encourage tooth growth much faster than that baseline rate, then what we're saying is vitamin C doesn't really have an effect on tooth growth. 
So placebo is just some kind of fake treatment, often some sort of sugar pill or something, uh, usually associated with, sub with experiments done on humans or animals. The next topic is principles of experimental design. This is what things should you focus on if you are going to design your own experiment? What aspects of the experiment should you pick specifically in order to design a good experiment? The first one is control. You want to choose how much of what the treatment is and when the treatment will be given. So all of the specifics surrounding the treatment are considered control. You are in charge of choosing how much vitamin C to give. You are in charge of choosing when to give the vitamin C. You are in charge of choosing all of the other things you might give along with vitamin C. Maybe it's a sugar pill. Maybe there's some sort of fluoride-based vitamin C. I don't know, I'm making it up as I go. When you are actively controlling all the different parameters of the experiment, that is you influencing the control. Let's highlight that one. We need control in our definition, in our course notes. We want randomization. We're going to highlight that one, too, because it could, should go in our course notes. Randomization is a little bit easy when you're looking at a field of tobacco plants, and you just need to randomly sample some tobacco plants. But as soon as you get into experiments with uh, animal subjects, whether it be humans or guinea pigs or frogs or fish, randomization is a little bit harder to do, and we generally assume that if you haven't done anything to bias your sample, then we're going to claim that you have a simple random sample. So here we're just going to say ensure you haven't unduly biased your sample. And as long as you haven't unintentionally biased your sample somehow, then we're going to say, as long as it's animal subjects related, that you've probably sufficiently randomized your treatments. The last key word for our principles of experimental design is replication. It turns out in the world that if you're measuring how fast humans grow or how fast guinea pigs' teeth grow or how often the old faithful geyser erupts. Things are not constant in the world, and that's going to be a big concept in this class. There is not much constant in this world. Things are always variable, and there is always uncertainty surrounding them. Not all humans grow at the same rate. Some grow a lot before high school. Some grow a lot in high school. Some humans wait until college to grow a lot. Guinea pig teeth are going to be the same way. The eruptions from Old Faithful are going to be very similar. Sometimes it erupts very quickly back to back. Sometimes it takes a very long time to erupt next. And sometimes the eruptions last a long time, and sometimes they don't. The key to avoiding this high variability, or the key to dealing with this high variability, is replication. You want to ensure you have a large, as large as you can make the sample, and representative sample. Statistics is all about making the statements about the population from a sample. What we're really trying to say with the word replication is your sample can't be too small. It needs to be a fairly large sample. We will look into defining how large is large enough later on, but I'll be honest up front, there's no great answer to that question.
So our last topic for the day is going to be the word confounding variable. And this is a variable whose outcome can somehow inadvertently affect the relationship between the explanatory and the response variable you're interested in. The Biostat book gives an excellent example of this. And so I'm just going to kind of replicate that example for you here. Say you're interested in the relationship between the explanatory variable sun exposure and the response variable skin cancer. Now, it seems reasonable to assume that the longer you're in the sun, the more skin cancer you get, something like that. But often, an issue that shows up in a simple relationship like this is what we would call a confounding variable, and that lives somewhere over here. So we'd want to assume that there's this kind of causal relationship right there. But some people know that there might be this relationship between sun exposure and skin cancer. So instead, when they go out into the sun, they apply a lot of sunscreen. Well, that naturally begs the question of what is causing the skin cancer then? Is it the sun exposure or is it the sunscreen? Because this variable is messing up the direct link between sun exposure and skin cancer, we call sunscreen in this case a confounding variable. It's really quite simple actually to go through all the examples I've had in this lecture and find some sort of confounding variable. If you're looking at the CO2 uh, atmospheric concentrations of CO2, then humans are a confounding variable to the atmospheric concentration of CO2 on this planet we directly cause an increase in CO2 on the planet. If you're looking at Old Faithful, the temperature below the Earth's surface is really what's causing Old Faithful to erupt at specific times and for specific durations. So the temperature below the Earth's surface, I'm going to go with the word mantle, but somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that, is really going to be a confounding variable between the duration and time in between Old Faithful eruption events. For the tooth growth data set on guinea pigs, wow, for all of us biologists here, genetics is often a confounding variable if you're ever doing any kind of study on animals. Genetics is often a confounding variable. So I'm going to leave you all with one last example from inside R. Here is a data set for you to look up and you try to answer for yourself, is this an observational study or is this an experiment? For whichever you think it is, do you think you could identify a confounding variable in this case? Or do you think you can identify what control looks like, what randomization looks like, and what replication looks like? This is a good challenge for you and I'll leave this lecture here.